Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be doing the long-awaited update to my Criterion and Blu-ray collection. The last time I did one of these videos was about two or three years ago and my Criterions and Blu-rays have grown a little bit since then. So I figured with everything moving over to this YouTube channel, now would be the perfect time to make a video like this. So the most recent addition to my collection has been this World of Wong Kar Wai box set. It has, I think, six or seven of his films in here. Mainly got it for Fallen Angels and Chunking Express, but I know there's also a copy of 2046 in here. It comes in this nice box here. Yeah, it's just a really stunning design, uh, both this booklet and here. Of course, there's uh, all of the films but there's a couple in here that I haven't seen as well. So I'm really excited to check out those versions of his films. Next up, another hefty addition to the collection from Criterion is the complete films of Agnès Varda, who is one of my filmmaking idols. And if you don't know, her honorary Oscar speech is what gave the dance of cinema its name. She mentions the feeling of weightlessness and feeling like she's dancing uh, whenever she's on a film set. And that feeling is something that I often try to chase. Again, another beautiful just book of a lot of behind the scenes. There's a section in here for Jacques Demy as well, which is pretty beautiful. Getting into the rest of my collection, we have Marriage Story. This is my favorite film of 2019. One of my favorite films of all time. I saw the premiere of this film at Telluride uh, where Adam Driver was in attendance, got introduced by Martin Scorsese, gave a little talk about why Adam Driver is one of the, if not the, finest actors of this generation. Next up is not part of the Criterion Collection, although it should be. Uh, as well as a lot of his other films, but it's Spencer by Pablo Lorraine. Was my favorite film of 2021 and has slowly risen the ranks of my top 100 list and is now just one of my favorite films. Also, the cinematography by Claire Maton is absolutely stunning on 16mm. It's one of my favorite shot films and I use a lot of screenshots from it in lookbooks pretty regularly. Next up, we have Ikiru, one of my all-time favorite films. I feel like I'm gonna be saying that a lot. One of the most life-changing films I've seen, one of the most emotional experiences I've ever had while watching a film. It's very minimalist in its approach visually, but also so meticulously crafted, and uh, Takashi Shimura gives an all-time performance in this movie. Next up, we have Francis Ha, which used to be in like my top five of all time. It's one of my favorite films. A lot of people refer to it as mumblecore, but I think this is sort of the venturing of Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig out of mumblecore into more traditional narrative cinema. Uh, this movie is brilliantly written and really beautifully shot. I'm pretty sure they used like a Canon 5D or like a Lumix GH2 or something to film this. So. Uh, it's a constant reminder to me that you don't need, you know, necessarily an Ari Alexa to shoot a really nice feature film. This one's not part of the Criterion Collection either, although it should be, uh, but this is the Coen Brothers masterpiece, No Country for Old Men. Used to be my favorite film of all time for a long time. Yeah, can't recommend this movie enough. Okay, next up we have Throne of Blood. This, besides Seven Samurai, is my favorite Kurosawa film. It's an adaptation of Macbeth. Cinematography, the performance, especially from my favorite actor of all time, Toshi Mifune, is intense and staggeringly beautiful and savage. Yeah, this is one of my favorite movies. Uh, really good memories of getting to show Jade this movie for the first time. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Here we have a movie that's in my personal top 10 of all time, and I don't really know if it can ever leave. This is Juzo Itami's Tampopo. It's a genre mixing comedy, western, culinary experience, romance. Uh, Koji Yakusho has a really fun cameo in this movie. Uh, yeah, it's 1985, pretty short watch, but it's an essential viewing for any culinary um, aficionado or cinephile alike. It's just 
one of the most perfect films I've ever seen and does storytelling in a way that uses vignettes and cutaways in a way that I've never really seen done before. Okay, this one's not part of the Criterion Collection either. I don't really see a lot of animated films on there. This is Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. Not much to say that hasn't already been said about this film on my channel and on others. This is maybe the greatest animated film of all time. And uh, yeah, it's a magical experience. I actually haven't opened this one either. It's unopened under here, but I'll probably be cracking this one open soon and giving it a rewatch. Here we have Kurosawa's masterpiece. This is Seven Samurai. I believe this was the first Criterion that I ever owned. I bought this way back in film school uh, when the Criterion collection first became a thing. Um, and it's super minimal, but it's again, one of my favorite designs that Criterion has put out. There's a certain like texturing and blur effect on the font that makes it look like aged feel to it. Um, and this is one of my prized possessions. Here we have Cure from Kiyoshi Kurosawa in my top 10 films of all time. Again, pretty recent entry. It actually has like a little dent on it. I don't really know where that came from, but I'm kind of pissed off. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is basically as invasive and hypnotic of a film that I've ever seen. First time I watched it, I don't know if I particularly loved it, but I couldn't get it out of my head over the next few weeks. And after talking to uh, one of my best friends, Claudius, over at Framed Film and discovering that he also loved this film, I gave it another watch. And ever since then, it's just been stuck in my mind. It's an absolute masterpiece of symbolism and acting and subtlety and nuance in performance and blocking. It's it's just phenomenal. So I would definitely check it out whether you like horror films or thrillers or not. Another super personal one to me that also has like a dent in the top. I don't know. It must have happened when we moved into this house or something, but I swear I take really good care of my criterions. Super bummed. Uh, but yeah, this is Hayao Miyazaki's Kiki's Delivery Service. Personally, this is my favorite Ghibli film, even more than Spirited Away, uh, simply because of what it meant to me growing up. It's kind of like my go-to coming of age slash comfort movie. And especially now with my daughter, Kiyomi, we call her Kiki, uh, coming into the world last September. Um, this film just means even more to me. This is gonna be the first film that I show Kiyomi when she's old enough. Here we have The Tree of Life, my favorite film from Terrence Malick and also formerly my favorite film of all time for like five years. This film has changed my life several times. Uh, there's not really much I haven't said about it on this channel yet, I don't think, but um, probably the most emotional experience I've ever had in a film also. One of my favorite designs. This and Seven Samurai, I think, are my favorite designs that Criterion has made, even though it's just a simple, like, composite of two shots from the movie. Um, yeah, definitely recommend this. This one also has the extended cut in it, which I saw in theaters um, and kind of blew my mind. If the lighting's changing at all, it's because the sun is setting super fast. Bear with me if these shots don't match. Next up, we have another top tenner for me. This is Gojira by Ishiro Honda. This was, I think, the first movie I ever watched. Um, my parents did an excellent job putting me onto Japanese cinema uh, early on, and I've been obsessed with Godzilla movies ever since I was like four years old, three years old. Um, there's pictures of me in the old Japanese bookstore that we used to frequent, just holding up Godzilla movie DVDs and just the biggest smile on my face. Godzilla just means a whole lot to me. We have a home theater in the basement now and it's Godzilla themed. Um, just the entire franchise, but the 1954 film especially just mean so much to me. Little spoiler alert, but my favorite film of all time. Uh, it's not on Criterion, but I do have the Blu-ray of it. It's Maburoshi. It's the directorial debut from Hirokazu Koreeda. It's my favorite film as said by Time Out Magazine on the front here, profoundly moving. It's 
just beautiful in its simplicity. And I have only seen this maybe three times, but I go back to it every time I write my own feature film because the storytelling in this is just so phenomenal. Also has Tadanobu in it. Yeah, really cool cameo from one of my favorite actors. Here's a Blu-ray. It's the only television series that I own, but it's Cowboy Bebop. Probably besides Breaking Bad, my favorite TV series of all time. Uh, definitely favorite animated TV series. This one is unopened under here. I haven't actually opened this, but the next time I decide to rewatch the entire series, I'll be opening this one up. Next up, I have the duo from Criterion for Yojimbo and Sanjuro. One of my favorite pieces, again, just because of the design and the kind of faded effect that this is printed as. And yeah, these are two essentials for the samurai genre. Okay, so that's about the halfway point of my Criterion collection so far. Just had to turn on this overhead right here. Heat up a warm drink, sit back, get cozy, and let's dive into the rest of my collection. Here we have Terrence Malick's Days of Heaven just a flawless movie. When I was programming the Malik retrospective for my old job at International Film Series, uh, this was one of the prints that we got on 35 millimeter, along with The Tree of Life, Badlands, uh, The New World, and Thin Red Line, which is coming up next. This movie has always stricken me as one of the best shot films of all time, especially considering that the cinematographer was going blind while shooting. I just remember the story of him having a Polaroid camera on set with him and having to take photos of what they were actually shooting so he could hold it up close and see what they were getting. Um, so Days of Heaven, just a beautiful film. The burning field sequence is like engraved in my mind forever. So like I mentioned, Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line is up next. This is my favorite war film or anti-war film of all time aside from Grave of the Fireflies. This was actually the first film to make me cry. I remember I'd never cried at a movie and then during the village raid sequence of this film, I just bawled my eyes out. <laughs> Um, partially to do with Hans Zimmer's masterful score, but also just because of the fluid and poetic and humane way that Malik directed this conflict. Uh, this movie has always stuck with me. Next up is Andre Tarkovsky's Mirror. Um, formerly my stalker used to be my favorite, but Mirror has recently overtaken it. I see this as sort of a sister film to The Tree of Life. Um, it's a spiritual odyssey and not many films I've ever seen come close to the emotional and existential heights that Mirror does. Um, I don't really like the cover of this. <laughs> they like overexposed the sky for some reason. In the film it's like this nice dusk, but for some reason it's, it's blown to white here. I guess so the title can be read better, but... Yeah, they kind of did the same thing for The Tree of Life too, where they just kind of put two shots on top of each other and flipped them. Um, but yeah, I don't really love the cover of this, but because the movie means so much to me, I, I had to own it. Here we have Alfonso Cuaron's Roma. Um, this is my favorite film of 2018. And I saw this at the Telluride Film Festival where Cuaron was in person to introduce the film Roma, it's a masterpiece. My second favorite Tarkovsky film, Stalker. The ending for Stalker is one of the most memorable scenes of all time for me. And yeah, this movie's kind of just like a trance. The first couple times I watched it, I was just completely absorbed. I might have even nodded off a couple times, to be honest. Um, but over the years, I've kind of grown with this film and my interpretations and experiences and takeaways of it kind of change as I get older. Next we have the Coen brothers Inside Lewin Davis. I don't really like the cover for this one either. I don't know why. I guess I just don't really like when live action films get hand-drawn covers. It's not like always the case, but I don't really know if this one works for me anyway. But I love this movie so much I had to own a copy of it. This is another film where the first time I watched it, I don't really think I got it, but as I've gotten older and experienced more life, um, this movie has meant a lot for me. Next we have Three Outlaw Samurai. It's the debut film by Hideo Gosha. I remember watching this and noticing that each of the three main samurai characters in this film looked like a member of my family. Um, the three leads looked like 
my father, my father's father, and my mother's father. So the whole time I was watching this, I kind of likened each of those characters to these monumental figures in my life, these men that mean so much to me and have taught me so much. And this film, likewise, has taught me a lot uh, about honor and codes and ethics and um, friendship. It's just an amazing movie that doesn't really get talked about at all because I don't think anybody knows about this movie. Yeah, Three Outlaw Samurai. Gotta check it out. Next up we have Edward Yang's E.E. E. This is a pretty long movie that I've only seen twice, but each time I've been even more floored by it than the last. The performance of this kid is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, the kid in the film, Yang Yang, is just kind of reminded me of myself as a kid, going around with my camera and making images for others to see. It's one of the defining films of my life. It was made in the year 2000, set the bar pretty high in terms of going into the new decade and decades after that, because not many films really reach the heights that EE e. does. Next up, we have Nobuhiko Obayashi's House. This is, again, one of my favorite films. Uh, first time I watched it, kind of hated it, to be honest, and now it's just, I've embraced the chaotic nature of the movie um, and liked it even more after watching my favorite YouTuber, Captain Christian's video essay on it about uh, the inception of the idea. Uh, Obayashi wrote this with his then, I think, 10-year-old daughter um, and sort of drew from her nightmares and her stories and her ideas. Um, and now having a daughter of my own, I am just kind of inspired by how they took something from the eyes of a child, something childish, and made it pretty terrifying and existential. And there are even allegories in this to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I definitely didn't pick up on the first time I watched it, but yeah, this is a very layered movie, and I feel like a lot of people who know it kind of just refer to it as a crazy movie, but it's it's so much more than that. Here we have The Cranes Are Flying, another super underrated film. First time I watched it, I remember each passing minute, I just thought, this is flawless, it's flawless, it's flawless. Um, for 1957, the blocking and direction in this film are absolutely stunning, just innovative. Um, yeah, definitely recommend this one. Still Walking by Hirokazu Koreeda. I guess this is an exception to what I was talking about earlier. I guess I, I, I kind of like that this is a painting um, from a frame of the film. It's just a stunning, flawless masterpiece. Check it out. Bong Joon-ho's Memories of Murder. The first time I watched this film, I thought the ending was cheesy and a little goofy. Then a couple of years later, read more about the film, about why it was made and uh, saw an interview with Bong Joon-ho about the specifically final shot of the film. Um, decided to give it another shot, watched it again, and cried at the ending that I once thought was cheesy. And um, yeah, I am incredibly moved by this movie actually now. Um, it's a really powerful film and uh, now one of my favorite endings of all time. Next up we have La N, which was one of my favorite films back in my film school days. I think it was for everybody. I think this one's staying power is especially relevant. Um, it takes place in a then, you know, 1995 modern day France uh, with riots. And I think with the, I think with the political climate right now, this movie is more important than ever. Another Coriata film, this is Afterlife. Uh, it's a really beautiful film, sort of about purgatory, and it follows souls that are transitioning into the afterlife, but on their way there, they come to this institution where they're given the chance to hold on to one memory for the rest of eternity. Um, and then this film crew in the institution like recreates and directs the films for these souls to hang on to. So uh, it's a very, um, allegorical film and it's it's flawless like I wish I'd thought of this idea and made this movie um, also one of my favorite shots of all time comes from this film next up we have Ryusuke Hamaguchi's Drive My Car I just saw his new film Evil Does Not Exist uh, at a film festival 
And I think that film has even surpassed this one. Um, so I'm really hoping that they add Evil Does Not Exist to the Criterion Collection soon. Um, but yeah, uh, Drive My Car, uh, another long film, but it's one that every time I watch it, I take something new away from it. Um, it's a really powerful film, and I'm looking forward to seeing this one again soon. Also love the design of this one, even though it's just shots from the movie. I think the color palette that they chose and like the little graphic design elements they put in there it all works together really well. Next up we have Portrait of a Lady on Fire by Celine Schiama, another film shot by Claire Maton and one of my favorite endings of all time. It's a super powerful film, especially in the way that it uses restraint and lack of movement and music until it counts and then it really counts. Um, yeah, this is uh, definitely one of my favorite films from 2019. So this is the only Criterion that I own that I haven't actually seen. Uh, this is Samurai Rebellion by Masaki Kobayashi. It's starring my favorite actor of all time, Toshiro Mifune. Um, yeah, I haven't seen this. I, it was just on sale and it's kind of a goal of mine to see every film that Mifune was in. So I just bought it. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen it yet. I'm probably gonna check it out soon. Uh, this is a good time to plug my letterbox. I think I'm nearing 7,000 followers on there. So if you're interested in checking out any of my reviews or anything like that, um, lists, especially recommendations, uh, check it out on letterbox. But yeah, looking forward to checking this one out soon. And last but not least, we have Jigoku. It's a film by Nobuo Nakagawa. Only recently watched this, I think a couple of months ago with Jade, found it for free on YouTube and it's a uh, it's pretty shocking film. It's just a normal drama until the last 30 minutes where it turns into this poetic depiction of hell, basically. Jigoku means hell in Japanese. And it's kind of similar to House in that way, where it's just some of the most insane visuals that I've ever seen in a film. Um, all practically done. This was made in 1960, so uh, yeah, just the colors, direction, blocking, everything about this film is definitely worthwhile. Anyway, make sure to comment your favorite criterion that you own down below. Follow us on Letterboxd at Bruce Tetsuya, and I'll see you in the next video.